Hi, my name is Joel, Joel Vizla, and uh, I've been going to Access for around three years now. I began coming to Access when I was invited by the Scots, Chris and Tiffany, to fill in on an electric guitar one Sunday. Uh, within just that day, I was able to meet Jordan and Kristen, and, and in just one day, built a relatively strong friendship. Um, from there, I had the opportunity to, to be invited back more than one weekend, and uh, I got to meet everybody from there and kind of develop a friendship with all of Access to where it soon became my church. My previous music experience was uh, with secular music and I never quite played uh, or, or had the opportunity to in my previous churches or the way I was raised to, to perform an electric guitar in a church setting. Uh, before then it was predominantly just organ music or piano music with uh, hymns. Uh, so to be able to, to use what I learned by playing secular music and by touring in bands to now praise and worship. It was just an extremely rewarding part of my uh, experience here at Access. I'm not just playing guitar, not playing a four song set on a Sunday. Instead, I'm worshiping. Music's absolutely secondary. It's convenient that I am playing electric guitar when I'm doing it, but uh, I say predominantly, I'm there just in spirit to be ushering in the presence of God with a large community of people with the same mindset. I'd quickly made friends at Access and, uh, and it was very easy to get along with everybody. It's extremely friendly, but shortly after those friendships immediately became relationships of family. Uh, I developed you know, a brotherly and sisterly friendship with everybody there um, and it was very easy to do. Um, and those kind of those relationships kind of proved themselves and when, um, well in June my father had passed away and uh, before he had passed away, he was in the hospital, and when I had called Jordan to let him know, after I hung up the phone, no more than a couple hours later, Jordan was there beside me and my family, praying with us and, and just comforting us while we were going through everything. Uh, without asking, he just showed up. Um, and then a couple days later, when we had this service for my father in Melbourne, Florida, uh, with, again, without asking, everybody just showed up there to show their support and love. and. Um, it's kind of showed that I had that extra family there to support me and my family. Uh, it's kind of when I realized it wasn't just a friendship, but this was blood that we were a real family. If you were to ask me why I come to Access, it's because it's more than just a place to show up on Sunday to listen to music and hang out with my friends, but it's where I've grown spiritually and it's family. And that's why I'm Access. I uh, love that guy and I love our church. And I don't know what you think about when you think about church. I don't know what comes to mind. I don't know if it feels like something you do out of joy or out of obligation. I don't know if it's a sense of family or a sense of something that you just have to do because it's what people in the South do. But all of us, when we think of church, a different word comes to mind. And here's my hope. We're kicking off a brand new series today called I Am Access because we believe that the church, not just our church, but the church is a really, really big deal. It is. And if we believe that the church is a really big deal, then we should do something about it. We should celebrate it. We should all come together and wrap our minds and our hearts around one central cause and one central mission. And so that's what we're going to do for the next few weeks is we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a part of our church and a part of the church globally and really want to answer the question, does it really matter? Like, why does it matter for you to be a part of Access? And here's our hope. Our hope is that you leave here and you say, yes, I'm in. I, I love this place and I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm with the vision. I'm all in, and I want to help any way I possibly can to help reach people who are far from God. And so we're honored you're here this morning for the very first Sunday of I Am Access. Welcome to those of you who are watching at our Brandon campus this morning. We're so excited that you're here as well. We love you. We're excited to be with you. And we're going to kick off a brand new series. Now, I asked a question just a moment ago. What do you think of when you think of church? Now, let me ask you a question. Just out of curiosity for my own peace of mind, how many of you grew up going to church on some level? Now, this is an all-play. Even you and Brandon have to answer. 
Okay, a lot of people. How many of you grew up with no church affiliation whatsoever? Awesome. Several people. Awesome. Okay, great. It, church is a really interesting thing. And here's the interesting thing that I've realized is that all of us come to the table with a different experience of church. We all see church and what church should be through a different lens. Now, I grew up with a very unique perspective. You see, when I was born, my parents were full-time evangelists. And so what that meant was every single week, all the time, my family was in a different city speaking at a different church or a different camp or a different event somewhere. And so growing up, I had a unique perspective. I saw churches all over the country. I saw small churches and large churches. I saw churches of different racial mixes. I saw churches of different nationalities and different backgrounds. I've seen all different kinds of churches. I've seen conservative churches and liberal churches. I've seen crazy churches where people are like hanging from the chandeliers. And I've seen churches where people are afraid to clap, you know, and uh, they get really excited. They're like, I don't know what to do. And um, it's just, I've seen all different kinds of churches. Well, when I was about seven or eight years old, my family moved down to South Florida to a church in West Palm Beach. And they, they moved to this church that has become my home church. I, I love this church. And there's a lot of amazing things that happen there. It's like, I honestly believe that because of that church, I, I was saved from a lot of different pitfalls that many teenagers fall into. It's like I would get right up to a line, but because of what I was taught or because of what I knew or because of good influence from friends, I would back off from things that I knew I probably shouldn't do. Like church was amazing. And if you grew up in or around church, you've had a lot of good experiences like church camp. I loved church camp growing up. I made some amazing friends and what they do is they pack several hundred teenagers who are completely hormone filled into a campground for like five or six days together and it's like what's the worst that can happen and uh it always happened and it was just a lot of fun going to camp i saw a lot of amazing things happen i saw a lot of people that were friends come to faith in jesus because of church and i love that but i also saw a lot of goofy things happen anyone ever see a goofy thing happen at church before like churches would do these things like every year they would have a revival anyone ever gone to a revival yeah, like, woo, yeah, right, exactly. It's like in, intuitive, you just have to say that. Like, if you've gone to a revival, everyone's revival was a little different, but here's how it worked for me as a teenager going to church. They would bring, bring in a guest speaker from some other state, and he would come to speak to us, and no matter how many times you had prayed for salvation, no matter how many times you've made peace with God, it felt like this person would come in and convince you that you weren't quite saved yet. And so it was always a sense of like, I remember even as a teenager, a guy praying over me, and he said, he said, God, I pray that he will be tormented, that he will not sleep until he comes to full faith in Jesus. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but God, please let me sleep tonight. Like, I didn't know what that meant, you know? And, and so that was kind of weird a little bit. I remember it felt like every year, about once a year, the church would make a major evangelism push. And if you don't know what evangelism is, it can kind of sound like a disease. Like you go to the doctor to get some medicine, got the <laughs> evangelism, and and so evangelism is just simply sharing your faith. But what we would do is, instead of actually sharing our faith with our friends and our family members, which is what you should do, we would go somewhere where we didn't really know anybody, and we would share our faith so we could kind of pat ourselves on the back and feel like we had done a good job. I remember one time just something so goofy happened that forever marked me. My brother and I, at this time in our life, we were, we were traveling and we would speak at camps and churches, but we would do things, ministry specifically to kids. So we would do lots of funny things like puppets and magic and skits and all, all kinds of stuff. We would do these services for families and for kids. And so my church hired Michael and me, and they asked us to come to this outreach, this evangelism event they were doing. And I'll never forget how goofy and weird the event felt. We went into one of the, the poorest, most at-risk communities there in, in the area. And we show up there and we roll up in a bus with the sound system and and it's so embarrassing like I remember we we were in this neighborhood and before Michael and I were going to go on and do our part of the service they had these three little old white ladies and when I say little and old I mean like short and old and all three played an acoustic guitar and it was so weird because whether or not you realize that churches just do funny things and it feels normal to churches but it's so not normal and there was this song um some of you will probably know this. The song goes, be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Okay, that, that was kind of the, the song. But in the song, in church, when they sang it in church, the church would go crazy and the worship leader would say, be bold. And everybody would say, be bold. Okay, and so there were these three little old white ladies and they're singing to this group of people. They're like serving hot dogs, giving away broken down old used toys and old clothes. And they're singing and they're just strumming together, be bold. And nobody responded. Be strong. Nothing. And it was just 
so painful. And it's like, I realized that we were there doing this out of obligation and not out of joy. Like we, we were just there to pat ourselves on the back and to somehow appease our conscience because it wasn't something we normally did, but we wanted to do something so we could feel good about ourselves. To churches do other weird things like Jericho marches. You ever seen the Jericho march? This is something Pentecostal churches do. The story of Jericho is in the Old Testament about how God told his people to walk around the fortified walls of the city called Jericho many times for many days. And eventually God causes this miracle where the walls implode on themselves. So churches would do this and ask God for a miracle. They would just walk around. And so the church would just get in the line and just march around the auditorium over and over and over asking God for a miracle. Now that was always weird to me. But in college, my roommates one time, I came in and they were making fun of churches because they had all of their laundry on the floor and they were marching around it praying God would release the miracles, I mean the wrinkles from the clothes. So strange. And some years later, I began to realize something that even though as a kid I loved church, even though growing up in church, I had friends that went to church, we were there in church, but all the things that were normal to me, I began to realize that they weren't exactly normal things. The things that I had kind of taken for granted because I grew up around them, this kind of culture that the church had created, it was normal to me because I had experienced it for so long, but truthfully it wasn't normal. I remember some years later when I was in high school, my mom and dad were about to take a missions trip to Romania. And so because they were going to go there, there happened to be a Romanian church down in the Palm Beach area where we, where we lived. And so my dad was going to go and talk to the pastor and be there for a church service. And so we went. And this church service was so unlike any church service I'd ever been to. And so though I had been to different sizes of churches and different denominations of churches and different styles and flavors of churches, I had never been to a church service where I didn't understand everything that was going on. And they did all kinds of weird ceremonies and little sacraments and things that I had no idea what they were. And I remember having this sense of sitting there feeling like, this isn't normal. This is weird. And there was almost the sense of pride, the sense of superiority, which is like, I, I know how to do church. These, these people, they, they have no idea how to do church. But I, I know how to do church. And this is not the right way or this is not the correct way to do church. And I remember that feeling. And then years later, I remember looking back over my years at church and I thought to myself this. There was some weird stuff we did. We sang some songs that didn't make any sense whatsoever. We did a lot of things in church that was just goofy or it was silly or it was weird. I remember as a teenager, the youth pastor did this thing where he, he, he got a big trash can and he said, guys, next week we're going to confess of our sins and we're going to bring our sin to the Lord and we're going to take it and we're going to burn it. So next week, if you're here and you're struggling with porn, bring your magazines. If you're here and you're struggling with dirty music or cigarettes or weed or whatever, just bring your drugs and your, your porn and your sin. We're going to put it in this bucket together and we're going to burn it, right? And everybody brought all their stuff and they, they put it in the bin, but we never burned it. I don't even know what he did with the stuff, honestly. And I assume he burned it, um, maybe someday, but never really knew what he did. And I remember thinking about those things, thinking, it's strange. It's, it's weird. Like, I thought to myself, if I ever get to be a pastor someday, I want to create the kind of church that I would actually like to attend. The kind of church I would actually invite people to. Some, some years ago, uh, my wife and I, before we started Access, we had this cool opportunity. There's this awesome church. It's growing by leaps and bounds. It's this huge church here in Florida. And they, they brought us in to interview to be their college and young adult pastors. And it's a great church, and it's just full of energy and life, and it's growing like crazy. And we get there, and the service starts. And I remember looking over at Liz like a deer in the headlights, like, what? is this place. It's so, it was so over the top and so weird. And, and then I was like, we are not going to take this job. I could not work here. And then that evening they brought us back and they had us meet with all the young adults of the church. This is a church of thousands of people that didn't have any kind of ministry or groups or anything for young adults. And so they said, we want you to start a young adult ministry here at our church. And we get there and there's like a hundred young adults there in the room. And it's like, how amazing would it be? It's like almost starting from scratch with all these people and the people are awesome. And it just so happened that my college roommate attended church there. So after, after this meeting, I was conflicted because I had experienced the morning service and it felt so strange to me. It felt so different and so weird and so unique, like I, I wouldn't fit in. But then I met all these people and I was like, man, we could do something amazing here. And after that, that meeting, I took my friend over to the side and I said, hey, um, let me ask you a question, okay? I said, do you love going to church here? He said, yeah. I said, okay, let me ask you a follow-up. Um, how many people over the last few years have you invited or brought with you to church? And this is his honest answer. He goes, actually none. And I said, why? 
And he goes, I don't know, I just, they, they wouldn't get it. And I was like, okay, thank you. Thanks for that honesty. I can't work here. I can't. And we turned the pastor down and we said, listen, you've got an awesome thing going and I'm not judging at all. It's just not for us. It's just not because like I can't work at a church or be at a church where I feel like I couldn't invite people in, where I feel like I would feel awkward or weird if they joined me on some level. I, I just can't do this. You see, here's the thing I've started to learn is that if we're not careful, we, this church and churches across the country, will begin to create church culture for church people. We will begin to create a church culture that only church people understand. And intuitively, that might feel like a good thing. Maybe you're thinking, like, that's a wonderful thing because I want to know what's going on. But if you grew up in church, you've experienced it. You, you know when to stand up and when to sit down. You, you know when to clap your hands or when to sing. You know when it's appropriate to laugh or when it's appropriate to cry. You, you know what to do in certain situations. And so every church has some kind of a culture. But if we're not careful, we will begin to create a cult church culture that only church people will begin to understand. And in my opinion, this is a really dangerous place. If you have your notes there, the very first fill in the blank is so important. And this is it. It's that if we're not careful, we'll create a culture, a church culture that's only geared at church people. And as a pastor, it's something that's really important to me. If you're going to be a part of this church, you have to begin to realize that we are here to see you grow. Like our mission is so clear. We exist to lead people, that's you, into a growing relationship with Jesus. But it's not to lead church people into a growing relationship with Jesus. It's to lead all people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And if we're not careful, what tends to happen is there tends to be this, this proclivity, this gravitational pull towards making church about us and towards keeping us happy and towards making the insiders happy. And so what churches tend to do is they tend to fill calendars with tons of events and tons of things to do. And what happens is unintentionally, they take the Christian church people that are a part of their church and they pull them out of their communities and out of their work environments and out of the social settings that they would be in and they put them together. And what they do is unintentionally create this bubble around themselves. And I just want to say to you, if that's how you feel about church, you're really going to hate it here. Because we are going to work really hard to consistently do things to reach people who are far from God. Now, this idea, in my opinion, is, is so important. In fact, like, if we're not careful, we'll create church culture for church people. But here's the deal. If it's true that the message of Jesus is for everybody, then I feel like the church should be for everybody. If church was really only for people who don't really have a life on Sunday mornings, and they have nothing else to do, then that's fine. Let's create a church culture for just church people. That's fine. If, if church was really only for people who don't have a lake house or a beach house that they can go to for the weekend, so they're, they're busy anyways, but for those of us who can't afford that, we'll just, we got nothing to do, so we'll just come to church. Then, then that's fine. Let's create a church for church people. If church was for the parents of the kids whose kids aren't quite good enough to be on the traveling basketball or soccer team or baseball team, and they got nothing really to do on a Sunday, so we might as well go to church because that's what we're supposed to do, then that's fine. Let's create a church culture for church people. But if 2,000 years ago, God really did do something extraordinary. If God demonstrated his love in a way that was undeniably beautiful. If 2,000 years ago God did something for all, for all of humanity, for everybody, then I believe that the church should be for everybody. It should. It, it, we shouldn't create these unintentional walls where we in, unintentionally push people out because they don't fit in, because they don't know how to act the way we act or to think the way that we think. Like one of my core values is simply this, is that at Access, it's okay for you to belong here before you ever believe or behave. Like you can come, and even if you don't get it all, you may think, think to yourself, I don't, I don't get it all, but I, I, I liked what I felt there. Or I liked what I experienced there. Like we are going to be intentional about creating church that unchurched people feel comfortable coming to and comfortable attending. Now this idea you can find all throughout the Bible. In fact, I could support this scripturally a dozen different ways, but I want to take you specifically to one set of passages in the book of Romans. If you have your notes there or, or a Bible, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 3. To kind of set this up, I need to give you some context. It, it, the book of Romans is written by a guy that all of us have probably heard of. His name was Paul. But before Paul was ever Paul, Paul was born and his name was Saul when he was born. And, and as we first read about Saul, Saul was a tormentor of Christians. He, he was hated by followers of Jesus and there's a lot of reasons. He, he would beat people. He would abuse people that claimed to be followers of Jesus. He, he would cause followers of Jesus to blaspheme, which means he would take them and threaten them. He would say, like, you either renounce your faith in Jesus, or I, I will break your arm, or break your leg, or I, I will have you imprisoned or put to death. I mean, he was the worst of the worst. 
And Saul has this dramatic encounter with God later on in his life where God reveals himself to, to Saul and he says, why do you persecute me? Like, why do you keep telling people that I'm not real and why are you so aggressive about it? From this day forward, you will follow me. And he says this, he says, and as a way of marking your soul, I am changing your name from Saul to Paul. Well, well, Paul goes on and his life is radically changed. He has this massive conversion. It's amazing what happens in his life. And later on in his life, Paul begins to write these letters to different churches. He writes them to churches in Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi. He writes letters to a guy named Timothy. Like He writes all these different letters that are many of the books that we read in the New Testament. But in the one we're going to read, he's writing to this church in the city of Rome. Now think about this. Rome was powerful. A couple years ago, my wife and I went to Rome. Rome did everything they could to flee their muscles and to show off how powerful they were. If you've ever seen the Colosseum, the beautiful ancient Colosseum, now it looks like this beautiful old ancient relic. But what historians tell us is this, is that when it was built, it was covered in pure white marble. Everything on the building, everything you could see on the outside and everything you could see on the inside was covered in white marble. They even made the streets out of charcoal and, and, and black concrete as a way to make the, the, the Colosseum shine even brighter. All of this to show how powerful and great Rome was. And the leaders of Rome, Caesar and Nero and all the leaders throughout the history of Rome, they would do things to flex their power. In fact, they built this Colosseum to show how great great and mighty they were. They, they would torture Christians and beat Christians and use Christians as human torches and just feed them to lions. I mean, it was terrible, terrible, terrible to be a Christian in Rome. And yet there was this group of followers of Jesus. And Paul has talked to the different people who saw Jesus. He, he talked to the guys like Peter, who if you were raised Catholic, was the, known as the first pope. Or he talked to John or James, the brother of Jesus. And he talked to these guys who didn't just believe in Jesus. They had seen him. They saw him put to death. They saw his body slowly bleed to death. And they saw him asphyxiate himself. They saw his head hang in death. And then they saw him three days later after he had risen again from the dead. They were eyewitnesses. And he talks to them. And he hears their stories. And then he, years later, he writes this letter to this church in Rome. And the church is having this problem. Here was the problem. When he writes them this letter, they are arguing over who can really be followers of Jesus. And who is it that actually makes up the church? You see, in those days, there were these Jewish people who felt superior. They felt like they had this like, direct line, like a bat phone directly to God. Where they, could do, they, they had to follow these specific rules. But because they did that, it made them more holy. So they had certain foods that they would eat, certain foods they wouldn't eat. They had certain clothes that they would wear and certain things they wouldn't wear. But then there was this whole group of non-Jewish people, these Gentiles that came along. And the Gentiles come along and they have this sense that they're, they're entitled to. Like anybody should be able to follow Jesus. And the Jews were saying things like, well, you, you can't follow Jesus. You can't, you can't do that. You're, you're different than us. And that's where Paul picks up. Now, if you're here and you grew up in church, this may stretch you a little bit. If you're here and you grew up with some kind of a church context that you think is the right way to do church, I want to try to stretch you a little bit as we read these verses. Romans chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 21. It says this. It starts with, but now. And when he says now, he doesn't mean like now, like present day 2014. He means now, like just matter of years after Jesus had been, had been crucified on the cross and risen from the dead. Now the church is beginning to spread. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Now let me explain this to you. The word righteousness simply means right standing with God. And what Paul says is this, is that we maybe have never understood this before, but because of what Jesus did when he came and died on the cross for us, us, when he rose again from the dead for us, because of that, we now know that we can experience salvation once and for all. The deal is done, and you can be in right standing with God. He says this, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law of the prophets testify. This righteousness, or again, the right standing with God, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. He says, now once and for all, you don't have to do something to earn God's favor. It's already been given to you. All you have to do is trust Jesus with your life and believe in him. He says, it's given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who behave. No, it, it doesn't say that, but that's what all of us think. It's like salvation, righteousness, right standing with God is available to all of us. To all of us. And he's saying it's this to these two groups who are arguing over who is the right one. And he says, listen, salvation, righteousness, right standing with God is available to all of us. All of us who believe. 
Not who behave, not who have to follow all the rules and feel like they have to trip over themselves in order to please God. But it's available to all of us who simply believe. Then he says this, and this is really important. He says, there is no difference. This is a big deal. This phrase is a big deal. Because the readers who are reading this are like, well, well of course there's a difference. Of, co- of course there's a difference. Like, we're Jewish. We're holy. We're set apart. We wear certain clothes. We don't eat certain foods. We're not allowed to have bacon. Come on, like, throw us a bone here. There is a difference. There is a difference. To which Paul would say that there is none. You see, he, here's the reason. Here's the reason there is no difference. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned. The common denominator between all of us, all of you who have come to church your whole life, or those of you who this is your first Sunday ever in a church, the common denominator between all of us is all of us have sinned. And then he goes on to say this, for all of us have sinned, and all of us fall short of the glory of God. Of God. Now, this is a really big deal. The word glory simply means this. It means the greatness, the, the splendor. It means the majesty, the prestige, the beauty, the perfection of God. And he says all of us, we fall short of that. We, we don't measure up to God's goodness. And as a result, it's like God should reject us. We, he, he's so perfect and we are so not. And that's why there's no difference because all of us start at the same place. All of us are sinners desperately in need of receiving the gift of grace that God so offers. Now, in all of my life and of all the flights that I've taken, I think I've only missed one flight that was my fault. I was late for one. It was some years ago, before we ever started Access, my wife and I were going to fly up to Chicago. My wife was going to sing and speak at a, a, an event at a church there on the outside skirt, the outside part of Chicago. And so we, we go, and here's the deal about me. I don't ever like to be late to anything. Like, if I'm five minutes early, I feel like I'm a little bit late. Like, I like to be really, really early to things, especially to flights. And, and after September 11th happened, and airports got very, very tight with their security. And my wife and I left plenty early to catch this flight that we needed to catch. And so on our way there, unfortunately, we hit terrible traffic in Tampa as we were heading out towards the Tampa airport. And I kept watching my watch and thinking, okay, we got to move here. We got to get there. We got to move. And we get there and I parked the car and we hustled and we got in line to get our tickets. And when we get there, I noticed there was this sign on the wall behind the lady who was helping us check in. And it said, as a result of September 11th, all flights, all passengers must be checked in and ticketed 45 minutes prior to departure or they cannot fly. And I look up at the clock and I look at our departure time and it's like 46 minutes until flight time. And I'm like, okay, just Lord, please let this line move. I started praying like Moses, like let the Red Sea part and let me walk through. Just let, let something happen. But there was nothing we could do. And we waited in line, waited in line, waited in line. And I watched the clock on the wall tick down and we go to check in and it's like 44 minutes and 15 seconds uh, until our flight is supposed to leave. And I say to the lady, hi, thank you so much. We're here for flight 1211. We're here ready to go. And she looks at the clock and she looked back down at her computer. She said, I'm so sorry, you've, you've missed it. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. We were in line. Like we, we were here. We just weren't, we weren't here, but we, we were here. Just not, you can do something. Come on, please. I like winked at her and buttoned my shirt. Nothing was working. And, and she would not let us through. And then there were people in line, several behind us. And when they heard what flight we were on, they, they said, you're, you're not getting on. I said, no. And they started to complain as well. And I began to think to myself, well, you guys were like five minutes late. I, I was only like 30 seconds late. Can you do something for me? Well, she finally gives us our tickets and we go we walked to our gate, and it was very frustrating because we get there, and we look out the big glass window, and we can see the plane. It's there. But because of the rules, we can't go on the plane. Now, now think about this. I begin to think to myself, okay, I was only 45 seconds late, but I'm still not able to get on the flight. These people were three minutes and five minutes and 12 minutes late. Now, when they open the door and let people on, guess which of us they let on the plane? None of us, right? Because we were late, and it doesn't matter if you were 30 seconds late, 30 minutes late, or you missed it by a month. If you're late, you're not getting on the flight. What Paul says is this, is like, for all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It means we've all missed the flight. Like the same way we fell short of the glory of Delta, we have all fallen short 
of the glory of God, and there is nothing we can do on our own to receive his grace and his forgiveness. We've all fallen short. This is the picture the Bible paints. And so if you're here and you feel some level of superiority because you grew up in church and you know all the rules and you know the church culture, so you know when to stand up and sit down, you know when to sing, you know when to dance, you know when it's appropriate to laugh or cry, you you know what to do in church and you feel like you've got it all together, I just want to say to you, there is no difference. There's not. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, if you grew up in church, this is interesting. This is one of the verses that is taught to help people learn that we need God's grace. Like, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And most of us believe that that verse ends with the period. Like, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Have a good day. (laughs) It doesn't. There's more to it. In fact, it it doesn't even end there. And the next word isn't but. Like, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but. It, It doesn't end like that. The next word is and. It says this, we've all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified. That's just another fancy word to say that we're made in right standing with God again. And all are justified freely. Freely. By his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Essentially what this means is this. Is that God looked at all of us and realized we're all late to the gate. So some of you may have been 30 seconds late, and some of you may be running from the gate still, and you don't even know if you'll ever try to get on the plane. All of us were late to the gate. All of us should have missed our opportunity to be with God. And what God says is, you know what? I love them. Let them all in. Let them all in. Let them all in, because grace is a gift that is freely given to everyone. And here's my core conviction If the message of grace and the message of Jesus is for everyone, then I think the church should be for everyone. In fact, I'll take it a little bit farther. I think if the message of grace and the message of Jesus is for everyone, then the church should be uh, for everybody. Like we shouldn't do anything that excludes anybody. The church should be the most life-giving, enjoyable, inviting kind of place imaginable. And whether you've been a Christian your whole life or you've never made that decision, whether you're here and you have the whole book of Revelation memorized forward and backward, or you're ripping the cellophane off of a brand new Bible as you're walking up on a Sunday morning, There is no difference. We are all sinners in need of grace. And so if the message of hope and the message of grace and the message of Jesus is for everybody, then the church should be for everybody. The the next verse, if you skip down a few, verse 27, Paul says this. He says, where then is the boasting? Like, how can you be proud? See, we're all in the same position. We're sinners desperately in need of the grace of God. He goes on to say, it is excluded, which means there's nothing you can do on your own. You can't brag about it because you didn't earn it yourself. If the message of Jesus and the message of the church is for everybody, then I think the culture of the church should be for everybody. As you keep reading through the Bible, like one of my favorite verses in all the Bible happens in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we meet this guy named James. James is the brother of Jesus. Think about the amazing stories James would have. You know, James comes home from school and he's like, yeah, mom, I got a B plus on my test. And mom's like, great. Jesus, how did you do? He goes, I just healed everybody. You know, like... (laughs) It must be hard to be the brother of Jesus. And here's the thing we know from history. James never actually believed that his brother was the son of God until after the resurrection. Because could you ever believe that your sibling is the son of God? Could you? There's no way. And so he he didn't even believe that Jesus was the son of God until after he saw Jesus become the resurrected Messiah. And even after that, one of the most amazing stories of transformation is he went from not believing to being one of the leaders in the first church that just exploded all over Rome and all over the modern world. And in the book of James, there's this argument happening. And here's what the argument is. They're arguing again over who can be in the church. Like, like, who is the church for? Shouldn't it just be for Jewish people? We're the holy people. We're the people that have a direct connection to God. Jesus himself was Jewish. And so Christianity and following Jesus should just be for the Jews. And, And here... Is his response. And in fact, this verse has become to mean so much to me that this week I made a poster for myself that I've ordered that I'm going to hang in my office of this verse because it's so powerful. Acts chapter 15, verse 19, here's what James says. He said, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And we should do everything we can 
to make it easy to make church a welcoming environment for people who are far from God to come to God. We should not make it difficult. Some years ago, when I was in college, early on in college, I waited tables at a big national chain restaurant. And I just kind of minded my own business. Like the, the people that I worked with were some fun people and some, you know, enjoyable people. But there were some of them that were just really, really messed up. Like they would wait tables during the evening and make 65 or 80 bucks, you know. And they would go out that night and they would drink so much that they would drink away all the money they earned in the night. Like I, just, I never could get my mind around that. Like why would you work just to go get drunk? And so there was this guy that I worked with who, as I got to know him, he had this really amazing story. He was actually adopted as a very, very young child from Southeast Asia somewhere. And he was adopted into this family and this family had no connection with God whatsoever. He just, he just was adopted into this family. So he felt like he had hit the, the, the jackpot in terms of life. Like he'd gone from the poorest of poor to like living the American dream. And one day he came to me before work with like bloodshot eyes and he looked at me and he goes, I just got to talk to somebody and you seem like someone good to talk to. And I said, okay, <laughs> what do you want? And he goes, no, no, I can't talk now. I'll talk to you after work. So, okay. So after work, I waited and we talked and he goes on to tell me about how his life is falling apart, how he's made decisions, how he's living with this girl and they've got this situation happening over here and he, all the story after story of how his life is falling apart. And he said, I don't know. I just feel like I need to talk to someone and I felt like I needed to talk to you. I've never known God. You talk about God. You go to a Christian school. Can you tell me about God? And so I said, Sure, that's fine. So I began to talk about God and I began to share my faith in the best way I possibly could. And then I thought, okay, this is good. This is a good start. But I feel like your next step is you need to go to church. You need to come to church. He said, okay, fine. So a couple Sundays went by and finally I got him to come with me to church. And so I picked him up in my little 1993 Ford Probe. I picked him up and, and we drove to church together. And I went to a church that's, it's a good church and it's a big church. And this church has changed a lot since the time that I went with my friend to the service. And we, we go to the service and I walk in and I can't tell you how awkward everything felt to me in this moment. The service that I had sat in the week before that felt totally normal to me. The, the service that I had sat in many times over where things were just normal. Things were just, this is how we did church. All of a sudden I began to see it through his lens. And I sat with him, and first of all, we walked into the building, and there were greeters that had on these name tags that just said greeter. And they were talking to each other, and they only broke just to say hi to the guy, but they could care less about the guy. And we walked in, and I remember even noticing little things, like the bathroom didn't say men and women, it said brothers and sisters, and I was like, we are so weird. And, <laughs> and we go into the auditorium, and we sang songs. And the man who led the songs on the Sunday held the microphone and did this with his hand the whole time as if we were in like eighth grade choir. And I remember thinking like, that is so weird. And I remember listening to the words of the song that I've sung many, many times over. And I remember thinking, this is so weird. And we sat down and I just watched the guy like with deer in a headlight watch. And then the pastor walked up to, to, to receive the offering and he starts, well, amen, everybody. And everybody said, amen. And I looked at my friend and he's like, what is that all about? And I, I've, I have no idea. I really have no idea. And then he gets up to receive the offering and he starts crying and he does this like five to 10 minute talk about giving and how important giving is and how if you don't give, this is going to happen. And then he goes back and he sits in a throne chair on the stage. Like, <laughs> this is a true story. And my friend goes, what's with the king? Like, he didn't even know the word pastor. And I was like, I don't know either. And, and then these ladies come up with matching dresses that have these really poofy arm shoulder pads and big sprayed up hair and paint, I mean, uh, makeup that looks like they lost a paintball fight. And, and they sing a song together. And I'd never noticed it before. I never paid attention. There was always special music while they received the offering. I never paid attention. But on this particular day, I noticed they can't sing. It was, it was so bad. And I look at my friend. And then the pastor comes back up. And he says, well, hallelujah, amen, and glory to God, everybody. And then he goes into his message. And I remember sitting there mortified. Now, let me just say something. This is an amazing church, and it's a great church. And they've done so many amazing things for the kingdom of God, and I'm not judging them at all. But I'm saying for the first time, I, I begin to have context for this verse that we just read. That we shouldn't do anything that makes it difficult for people like my friend from the Olive Garden to come to faith in Jesus. 
That nothing about a church service should get in the way of a person receiving the opportunity to freely receive the gift that God offers. Like the only thing that should be offensive to a person in a church service is the verse we just read. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But everything else we do, from the quality of the way that we sing songs, to the words that we sing, to the way that we love and take care of your kids, to the way that we teach them about God, to the way that you're greeted and loved on when you come in and served as you're here, everything we do at a church shouldn't be difficult. It shouldn't get in the way of people receiving the gift that God so freely offers. And I learned something that day that has stuck with me here years into this journey of access. And here it is, and this is the bottom, fill in the blank for your notes, and it's this. It's if the message of the church, and maybe take it a step farther, if the message of Jesus, that message of hope and grace, if it's for everybody, then listen to me, then we dare not create a church culture that excludes anybody. This is the reason that we created Access. That's it. To create the kind of place where you could come and you could hear about God and learn about God and experience the joy of community and worship together and enjoy the service and have fun and learn and grow and grow in community with people. We wanted all those things. But one of the core values, one of the central thoughts is we don't want to exclude anybody because we believe the message of Jesus is for everybody. So here is what I'm going to ask you to do and what I'm going to ask you to pray about. If you're here and this is your church, if you would say, Jason, I'm in, I, I am access, then I need you to get on board with me on that mission. I need you not just to love it for yourself and to enjoy coming on Sundays, though that's great. I need you to be bringers because this is the kind of place where people who are far from God can hear about the life-saving gift of grace that God so freely offers. Let me close with this thought. Some years ago, I was helping another church uh, create a website. And um, for years, I've done graphic design and website design and all kinds of print stuff. And so I was having this meeting with this church and they didn't really have a website or the one they had was not very good. And so we sat down together to look at their website. And then I said, okay, now forget everything you know about your website as it is. What do you want your website, your new website to say to people? Okay, and he answered the question. I said, okay, if you had 30 seconds, 10 seconds, you have 10 seconds to tell me about your church, what would you say about your church? And I don't know what he did, but he kind of started hemming and hawing. He said, well, you know, and then he said something that was so offensive and so freeing at the same time. He said this to me, he goes, well, okay, Access, your church. Um, Access is kind of a starter church. And our church is more of a, a full-blown apostolic worship center. That's what he said. And he goes, if you're sick, if you're in the hospital, if you have a baby, we're not going to come visit you. We'll pray for you, but we're not going to come. <laughs> and I promise you, I was, I was with a guy, I was with another guy named Justin. I, I promise, I, my wife will confirm this because I came home and told her. I was with a guy named Justin, and we get in the car, and I was like, bro, did he just, because I heard, did you hear, the, what? Yeah. And, and I was like, okay. And so I remember saying to my friend, and I even responded to the pastor this way. I said, sir, if by starter church you mean that we exist to lead people into a relationship with Jesus and then to help them grow, then yes. Because I think that's what the purpose of the church is. To connect with people. People who are Christian, who have been a Christian their whole life. People like my friend that I'd met at the Olive Garden, people that are your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers, people that have no relationship with God or a distant relationship with God, people that have stiff-armed God, people that have flicked God off, and people that have loved and worshipped God their whole life. Because if the message of the church and the message of Jesus is for everybody, then with all of my heart, I believe the church should be for everybody. So if that makes us a starter church, then so be it. Let's own it. Let's love people. Let's serve people. And if this is going to be your church, if you're in, like if this, you say like, Jason, I am access. I love this place. I want to help fulfill the mission. Then here's how you do it. Be bringers. Invite people. Love people. Invest in them and then invite them to experience this kind of joy that we have together. If you're in, let's make this a place for everybody. Not just a place for people who get it and who go to church on Sundays because they feel like they have to but a place where everybody's welcome, where you don't have to believe in order to belong. You can belong first before you ever believe or behave. 
the, the kind of place where things are going to make sense. Like I've had people write me letters and make fun of me because I'll say things like, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. If you're new, Genesis is all the way to the left. Like a lot of people know that already, but for the people who don't, it's wonderful. And every time I hear a story like I hear over and over and over again about people who were brought to church because of a friend or brought to a church because of a relationship or people who never owned a Bible or who had never been to a church service and I hear the story of them giving their life to Jesus. Every time I see a baptism like we're going to celebrate in a few weeks together, every time that happens, there's a reason that in my heart I'm like, yes, church should be for everybody. So will you join me on that? Will you help us create the kind of place for people who have been a Christian their whole life or people who have never darkened a church door can come and get it and feel welcome? Because if the message of the church is for everybody, then we dare not create an environment that excludes anybody. Let me pray for you. God, this, um, this honestly just feels kind of like half of a message. This is, this is the first half of why we do church the way we do church. God, I pray that this week as we go, that we'll just wrestle with this, that we'll begin to understand that there's a reason we do church the way we do church. Not that we've got it nailed, not that we've got it figured out, but many of us drove past lots of churches on the way here this morning that are excellent churches doing wonderful things, but they're churches that have unintentionally become churches just for church people. And God, I pray that you'll keep us laser focused on this idea that we'll continue to push the limits, that we'll do whatever we can with excellence to reach people who are far from you. God, may we never become the kind of church that people feel embarrassed to invite their friends to, but may this be the most life-giving, engaging place imaginable. God, I pray that as we leave this week that you'll just drop into our hearts the names of friends, of co-workers, of neighbors, of loved ones who need a place like this. And may we, as a sense of honor, may we, as a sense of pride, just so love what you're doing here in our church and in our community, that we naturally invite others to experience the joy that we have. So God, we thank you for that. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.